Now, welcome to the 2023 State of the College. Um, I'm actually thrilled to be here in person. Um, I kind of went back and looked a little bit at the last couple of years, uh, states trying to do it from my desk via video, and it just uh, loses something in translation. So I'm just thrilled it's been three years that we can be back together. Now, when I started planning um, this discussion, you know, this address, um, I really tried to look back and think a little bit about the institution, about the community, what is it that gives us value, what is it that gives us impact. And I've sort of titled the address The Power of Plus. You know, it's the innovation, it's the creativity, it's the actions that differentiate us as an institution within the fields of vision science and optometry. Now, if you look at our strategic plan, in the center of the plan is student success. And for that to really happen, it really requires the concerted effort of every member of the community, but it also requires that we offer our students value-added opportunities that nobody else does. It requires us to provide them with the environment with the education, with the programs, with the clinical experience that differentiates them from graduates of other programs. And I do think we do that. Now, I don't know how many of you remember, but I've greeted a lot of you during new employee orientation. And one of the things that I've highlighted at times is that in a vertical building you know, with 20 floors, um, we often don't know what others are doing. We don't really know the impact of the institution as a whole. We know our job, we know our immediate community, but we don't necessarily know the institution. So I actually thought I would start with a little quiz. It has nothing to do with pay raises or merit. <laughs> this is simply a bit of a question if these numbers mean anything to you. Well, that says 345, 341 in first. Now I know some people know what this is, but it's basically what are the average optometry admissions test scores over all academic and total sciences for the class of 2023? And how do we rank nationally? First, not bad. 1,219,873 dollars. Any thoughts? Yeah, well people who know it are yelling out scholarship. So how much financial support do we give annually scholarships, grants, waivers last year? And last year represented about a $100,000 increase from the year before. 160. This one's harder. Not my age. <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody here is 160 years old. We feel like it, but we're not 160 years old. Um, how many degrees and certificates were granted this past year? We always think of about 100 students because that's the optometry program. We often don't necessarily think about the PhD students. We don't think about the residents. We don't think about the micro-credentials, the advanced graduate certificate in optometric business management. So if you look at that, you know, over time, we're doing more and more people are gaining access. So more optometric degrees, more residents, that program has grown significantly. New programs like micro-credentials. 3,896,278 dollars. <laughs> what were the research revenues last year? How much did they increase from the year before? It was a good year for the research community here. Up 27%. And we do rank third nationally among all the schools and colleges of optometry. 
And last number, 257,946, although I wouldn't necessarily place money on the accuracy of the last three digits. Patient encounters. What's that? Patient encounters. Patient encounters. How many patient visits did our students, our residents, our faculty support last year? Now, 60,000 of those were here in the University Eye Center, but we often forget you know, the impact that we have on the broader community through our extended programs, through our externship programs, um, and so on. And so when we really think about the past year, it's actually been a really productive, very successful year for all of us. You know, we celebrated, concluded our 50th anniversary celebration. You know, we addressed, you know, the expansion and development of our strategic plan, including a new uh, diversity and inclusion master plan. You know, we still continue to bring in extremely strong students. We've initiated the relationship with Downstate. That's getting going slowly. Research is thriving. University Eye Center is rebounding. You know, we're getting there, but it's a difficult environment in terms of uh, getting back to pre-pandemic levels. And certainly we have a lot of support from the state in terms of our capital. But we are also facing some challenges, okay? And certainly I think student affairs and the uh, admissions group knows better than others. It is a very challenging environment. We're thriving, but it's a very challenging environment in terms of the applicant pool. It's flat, and you'll see that in a moment. But there, and there are new programs emerging. There's a new college of optometry at the Rocky Mountain University for Health Professions. They're accepting a class this fall. High Point University in North Carolina is just appointed their founding dean. It'll be a couple of years before we see them in there. But I think all of you know and all of you recognize that when we look out there, there's a tremendous workforce shortage. You know, certainly upstate, um, I get a lot of alumni and a lot of comments about the inability to find eye care practitioners. Just the recruitment of our faculty, our students, not just recruitment, but retention of faculty, staff, and administrators is getting more and more difficult. You know, when you have an unemployment rate in the United States, you know, of 4.5%, and there is no such thing as unemployment in optometry, um, it's a significant challenge. We're still trying to improve the diversity of both our faculty and our students, um, build our patient base, improve the financial health, completion of projects. I mean, these are all challenges, but one that I think we're very well uh, up for. So as we think about the power of PLUS, we also have to recognize we don't do it alone. You know, certainly we do it as a community, but we also do it with a lot of partners. You know, we do it by broadening our base, whether it's through the clinical programs, the externships, the satellite clinics and, and health and hospitals corporation, but also very much within SUNY. And today I want to sort of highlight some of the areas that I think have been particularly successful um, and creative in the approach. And then I really want to address some of the future needs of New York State um, that we are well suited to address. So when we think about education, I'm gonna go through some of these quickly because you've seen these before. Yes, our students are strong, they're good. Average GPA, always above the national average. Obviously, OAT, you already, now you all know that we're first in the country this year. Yield, and this I think shows a little bit of the challenge that we have in terms of the recruitment, it's getting very competitive. Um, what you see here is yield, the line across is the national average. And that's been us over time, moving up. And yield, just to make sure everybody understands, yield is when we offer some, a student in a place, in a, a seat in the class, do they accept? And typically, we're in the 60s. What you can see is this past year, we actually dropped down 11%. We're still well above the national average, so we're not doing badly. But we did drop down, and that's a sign of competitiveness for particularly out-of-state students. This is, a, this is national data. And what you can see, and this is really over 12, 13 years, um, 
the number of applicants has gone up and down, but really trended within a certain area. So it's not like even though there's a great demand for optometrists in the US, and there's a lot of vacancies out there and people looking, it's not that there's a huge pool of applicants um, from which to grow. If you look at the matriculates, yes, it's gone up over time as programs have expanded. And then you can see the graduates obviously lagging by four years. But this is when they entered. And so that 2017 data point, that class of 2017, um, at the end of the graduate lines, graduated in 2021. That's the most recent data from ASCO. But typically, you can kind of see it stays steady over time. The attrition rate is about 8%. We're a little bit better than that. Um, but, you know, the attrition rate overall, you know, for every 100 students starting across the country, eight don't graduate. That's not high. That's really relatively low. Now, part of being competitive um, means that we need to get creative in terms of uh, really developing an edge, developing new relationships, new approaches, ways to connect with the students. And I need to do certainly a shout out to student affairs and particularly to, to uh, uh, Christian Alberto and Sav Ramirez you know, for their efforts in this program. But two years ago, they started the eye care camp. You know, this was recognized this year by SUNY as, a, as the 2022 SUNY Outstanding Student Affairs Program Award. Now, many of you have known certainly um, about the C-STEP program, but this was really, well, with some innovations and changes, an effort to make it so that we could attract students from outside of the state as well as in. It really kind of expanded that effort. And certainly it's to create new pipeline programs to attract students to our program, well-qualified students, and certainly to develop and, uh, better strategies to attract uh, racially minoritized students and economically disadvantaged students. So again, you know, as the world gets a little more competitive, we need to take on new approaches and new ideas. And certainly one of the elements, um, this is just actually a little bit of the profile of that program, 131 participants, 18 states, 20% first generation. So you can see it had a fairly broad reach. And a number of those students are now deposited or a part of our applicant pool. So kudos to the effort and clearly SUNY system recognized the uh, creativity as well as the impact of that program. And certainly one of the innovative elements of it was really team-based work. And certainly for prospective students, being a part of a team, being part of a community, addressing questions that are important to us and important to them um, is part of the design um, of that effort. So when we think about attracting a diverse student body, how have we been doing? And again, this is something, this is a slide that I use each year sort of showing that progress. We keep doing better, we still have a ways to go. But what you do see, and you can see certainly that it increases in that three year running average, number of applications as well as the number matriculated, um, is going up. It takes time, it takes effort. Um, but we are certainly doing better than if we go back in history a decade or so, you've got these numbers that are just abominable. Now, a word on the diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging initiative. I asked Dr. Harewood, our chief diversity officer, to share with me some points that she thought highlighted the year for the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. And you can read through these. And what really actually struck me was it's no longer just talking. It's not talking. It's not planning. It's walking the walk. It's implementing. It's embedding in our structure and in our organization the importance of the value of diversity. Diversity is one of our values. And so when you look at it, yeah, yeah, we've really sort of codified and embedded the Office for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. We've included or created standing committees for inclusive excellence. We've got people advocating 
on key committees, faculty search, um, student admissions committee. We've got recognition. So all of these things say that as a community, as an institution, as a college, you know, we are embracing not simply the value. We're trying to actually operationalize the value so that we carry it going forward into the future. Now, in optometry, in any health profession, you know, the uh, bottom line question always becomes, you know, do your students graduate? Do they get licensed? Are they practicing? Well, indeed they are. Now, these are outcomes that are required um, to be on our website. They're required to be communicated publicly so that students and prospective students can make decisions. But this is really just the bottom line. This is just the core. This is not the plus. This is not the power plus. This is not the value added. This is are we successful with our basic effort to ensure our students succeed in the optometry program in our practicing. The top two graphs are part one and two of our national boards. There's three parts. And these are first time takers. And actually you can see sort of over time, you know, the lines go down a little bit. But what you've got is SUNY in the blue at the top, and you've got the national average in maroon at the bottom. Now what's interesting is over the last three years, and of course it's also during COVID and during the pandemic, but what you saw particularly in part one, you just saw that plummet. You know, where only about 65% of students across the country pass part one our on their first try, on their first try. Our students were at 86, 87% and they stayed steady throughout. Now that's largely because of the adjustments we made as a community. It was because of the efforts of our faculty to ensure that the impact of COVID, displacing our students from the classroom, moving to more of a Zoom-oriented community, did not negatively impact their chances of success. Now the one on the right, we just calculated this morning because um, we now the data has been posted on the uh, on the uh, national board website, the performance nationally, uh, our students uh, were around 94 percent. Nationally, the students uh, were at about 84, 83 percent. Never in the, at least the history of the data that we have has our students been operating so far above the national average. That, that doesn't mean that our students can't do better. <laughs> um, and it's a little scary that on a national level, um, the scores or the first time pass rate um, has gone down so much. And then of course, uh, ultimate pass rate, meaning past all parts prior to the date of graduation. Um, you know, we had one year, 2019, which was not such a hot year, um, but by and large, we're still in a very strong position there. But as I mentioned at the top, to me, the, the core is the easy part. It may not be easy for everybody. But I think every student who's graduating should, and they do, certainly within a reasonable period of time, be successful at getting their licenses and practicing successfully. But what we do is we give our students far more opportunities, different programs, different options, things that do distinguish them in the marketplace. Many of these are certainly new in the last decade, and some are very recent, like the micro-credentials program. Uh, certainly, residency advanced competencies is not a program, but it is a major effort to elevate our residencies and be much clearer on expectations and the knowledge and skills that residents develop over time. Now, behind the program, behind all of these programs that we provide for our students are the faculty. And I did want to highlight this year because it's a new program, is the Early Career Clinical Faculty Development Program. I know this has been a very important program to Dr. Troilo, and I know the Faculty Development Committee has been working very hard in order to ensure its success. It's been well supported from what I can see, well supported by uh, chairs and chiefs and, and other senior and, and mid-career faculty to help provide a much better structure to our new faculty as they begin to develop their career paths to find their expectations 
and look at their path to, to success in graduation. So these are certainly some of the objectives. You know, but I think that and, you know, any one of you, you don't have to be a faculty member, I think whether you're a faculty member or a staff member, these are kinds of characteristics that you do want to see, that you do want help with. You know, uh, certainly developing the individual development plans to think about their path you know, over the coming year and beyond so that they can be certainly successful. Now what I would say is as far as I know, I don't think there's another College of Optometry in the country with a faculty development program that has been developed to this extent. They do exist in medical schools and I know that a lot of those ideas have come from, from medical schools. Um, but it certainly shows sort of initiative and hopefully a greater commitment and this is maybe a way in which we can better retain um, faculty um, over time as well. So when you think about our educational programs, you know, just kind of keep in mind, these are a lot of programs. This is a pretty complex operation in terms of getting these students to not simply be doctors of optometry, but to be excellent doctors of optometry plus that there's more there that they get from being a part of our community than they may in any other program in the country. Now, in terms of the research program and efforts, you know, clearly, you know, 27% increase year over year, third in the country. Um, we're certainly being successful by these kinds of metrics. This is just data, and, and I wouldn't get into it too much, but again, it's sort of the ASCO data. It looks not at, at research expenditures, but it looks at research awards. And again, it just sort of highlights uh, where we are um, relative to the other programs. Now, Dr. Bloomfield and staff provided this information. I think it's been, some of it's been shared uh, at faculty meetings. Um, but in fiscal year 23, the current fiscal year, we're sitting on $13,757,000 worth of grants. Now, that's not in one year. That's the total value of the grants that are currently active. Um, and we have five plus additional uh, federal grants pending. Now, part of our success isn't simply the numbers, but it's also the strategy that has been employed to achieve it. And certainly 10 years ago, the Clinical Vision Research Center was created. Over the past 10 years, that has grown, and I'll show some of those data, and clearly the building of the new center on the 14th floor is a statement of the center's success. If you go back to when it was started, this is an article from a annual report back in 2013, um, announcing the opening, enrolled over 175 patients. I mean, at the time that this was published back then, that really meant 175 patients over about a six to nine month period of time. Certainly some of the folks involved, some are still with us. Um, Dr. Benevente Perez, uh, Dr. Ida Chung, Dr. Shulman Ellis, and Dr. Vercella, you know, were sort of a part of that initiative. Um, and Dr. Catherine Richmond, Richdale, uh, rather, um, was the director at the time in, in getting that started. But when you look at the data for this first decade, Remember 175 patient visits over, uh, subjects rather, over uh, six months? Well, that's up to 3,500 patients. I know Dr. Fry uh, is very uh, intent on getting that 100th study before the end of the 10th year. You know, 10 hundreds has a nice symmetry to it. But we're doing you know, 15 studies a year on average over the past five years. Enrollment of subjects is 100%. That is, that is remarkable. You know, it's, it is so difficult to recruit and retain subjects. So 30 sponsors, including NIH, investigators 20, the staff and the faculty of the Clinical Vision Research Center, you know, are the power behind its success. You know, and so certainly a thank you to, to the Clinical Vision Research Center and the faculty that have been engaged in those studies 
it's meant a lot and it's differentiated us and it's given our students a different environment in which they could thrive. Now, not long ago, we were notified that up on the 16th floor, there are two spaces that used to be teaching laboratories that are now down on the lower lobby. Okay, the project has been approved to transform those into translational uh, research laboratories, as well as upgrading the HVAC structure on that. But the goal here has been to be able to um, contribute to the knowledge of the profession, the knowledge of vision science through basic research, translational research, and clinical research. And with these projects, it gives us growth opportunities and it allows us to basically address the whole, uh, uh, the whole range um, of research uh, going forward. Patient care. 257,946. That's a big number. Now, we've done a great deal, you know, um, obviously in, in trying to increase, improve, and upgrade, um, you know, our own site, but we do have to keep in mind that we have a really rich network of clinical opportunities and educational opportunities. Um, a year ago, we were sharing that the four centers that were owned and operated by Health and Hospitals Corporation was expanding and that we were going to be helping to support, provide faculty to eight. At that time, there were four. There were four being built. This year, those have been built and we've staffed those clinics. Patient base is building and eventually these become a rich opportunity for our students in terms of their education and training as well. I know recently, having some conversations um, with Dr. Wong, um, really kind of looking at this expanse of educational experience and looking at ways as how we can elevate and better identify. I know he and his team are looking at the criteria by which we approve that somebody is a part of our affiliated network, a part of our externship program. And we have to always constantly keep an eye on the network. Now, just within the five boroughs, if I remember correctly, within the five boroughs, about 150,000 of those 250,000 visits occur within those five boroughs. The UEC, making progress, coming back. We got up, to, we peaked at around 70,000. We're still at around 60. Um, revenues have come back. The green line is patient visits. The red line is actually a monthly target, you know, looking to get up to about 63 or I think it's about 63,000 patient visits per year. Running a hair behind, but not too badly. Um, this is a big challenge, particularly as New York still has not returned to the workplace. You know, so much of New York is still telecommuting, um, those are patients we may never get back. And so we do have to continue to build. And certainly some of our efforts in terms of our facilities, I mean, our pediatric clinic is, is a wonderful clinic. Anybody who's visited it and toured it and raves about it. Seventh floor, you know, the money's there. It starts this summer. You know, gonna be a disruptive couple of years, but, you know, hopefully as we upgrade our infrastructure into the 21st century, you know, what we will find is that some of that patient census begins to grow and develop along with it. But in each of these plans, there is innovation, there is change, there are ways to better educate and there are ways to increase and improve the patient experience. The fifth floor. Now this is from last year, very creatively. Um, the UEC actually partnered with the New York School of Interior Design to do a program and look at what a new fifth floor rehabilitation service might look like. It probably won't look like this at the end, but it did get approved for a design study that has begun and is going on now that will sort of translate this into the first step of detailed design, bid documents, and construction. So we have been 
certainly sort of lining up um, our efforts to really uh, make it a state-of-the-art institution. Now, as we look at the future, though, one of the things we need to think about, um, and I'm going to take this statement very seriously, we are New York's College of Optometry. We're supposed to be serving all of New York State. Right now, there is a shortage, a huge shortage. People cannot find people. They're offering loan repayments. They're offering reasonably high salaries. They're offering signing bonuses to try to get people to move upstate. If you look actually at, we've talked to two or three of the larger commercial retail uh, uh, providers up there. One unable to staff 21% of its locations. Another one, 85%, is looking for additional time. These are what we have right now. We've got student rotations, and I'm defining upstate as anything north of Westchester, Rockland. Very liberal interpretation of upstate, downstate. Um, when you look at that, we have five rotations. They're not always filled. Students don't always choose them. We have one residency that's just starting. It'll start next fall. That, that's, that's at the Flom Institute at the University of Rochester. We're also in progress in talking with Upstate Medical Center's Department of Ophthalmology um, for a second residency. But when we start to look at the data, this is what New York State begins to look like. Right now, there's 2,561 actively licensed ODs. That's less than 100 more than it was in 2010. But on average, only 18 to 19 ODs, on average, will practice upstate. Ophthalmology in 2010 had 1,558 ophthalmologists in New York State. That's down to, actually that number has changed, 1,350. It included people who were deceased and people who had completely retired and left the state. So that number is actually 1,316. So there's been more than a 15% decline in ophthalmologists in New York State over the past 10 years. And In a recent survey, Dr. Soroka, Dr. Soroka has been working on a lot of this data, and so thank you to Dr. Soroka for, for uh, providing these. But a recent survey, 900 people responded. 25% of ODs plan to retire within the next five years. So if you have 2,500 in the state, 25% is more than 500. Now, when you only have, very quickly, New licenses every year averages out to be about 94. Only six to nine, 69 of those actually practice in New York State. Notably, that includes our residencies, our residency class. And if you look at our in-state residencies, we've got 37. So that, of that 69, 67 of them are our residents. Now, we're looking at how many residents stay in New York State, and about a third of them seem to leave. So that number 69 is probably more like 55, 56 new licenses on an annual basis. When you think about 500 retirees, we're not keeping up. And it's even worse upstate. So if you look at the differentiation of those 69, 44 are downstate and only 18, 19 are upstate. So you've got over 7 million people upstate and you've only got 18, 19 new ODs on an annual basis. So the trend is in the wrong direction. The need is great. And so today, I've mentioned that, that we were talking with uh, Upstate Medical Center about ways in which we could improve workforce upstate. We've signed, along with Dr. Mantosh Dewan, the president of Upstate, a non-binding letter of intent to establish an extension program at Upstate Medical Center. 
Enrollment would be limited. The goal will be about 30 to 32 students completing their entire program. You know, their fourth year would be the same. It's the same program. You know, the lectures would be delivered remotely, but the teaching laboratories would be there. They would be in person. They would be actively engaged. There will be faculty in Syracuse. Our program, our employees, our outcomes, our expectations. Clinically, it would be very collaborative with the Department of Ophthalmology and sort of developing and being a part of the uh, healthcare delivery system um, at Upstate. Clearly, it would be, have to be self-sustaining. But the evidence suggests, the medical evidence, residents, medical residents generally practice within 100 miles of where they train. And of course, medical residents are there for several years. The concept being is the only way to really get optometrists to go to upstate New York is to train them more extensively in upstate New York. Now, this is the beginning. There is a project team that's been created. There are a lot of things that have to get addressed. You know, obviously, workforce, content, clinical education, there are a lot of elements to having an extension program. It needs to be accepted by New York State Department of Ed. It needs to be reviewed and approved by Middle States Commission on Higher Ed. And it needs to be reviewed and approved by the Accreditation Council on Optometric Education. So a lot of steps, business plans, feasibility studies to do this. But there is a commitment by both institutions to try to make this a reality so that at the end of the day, we serve all of New York State not just New York City, not just Long Island, Westchester, Rockland, New Jersey. It's not really part of New York State. <laughs> but when people think of the State University of New York College of Optometry, we are recognized as New York's College of Optometry. Not New York City, but New York State. So this is a major initiative. It's going to take time and energy, and it's going to engage a lot of the community. We need the faculty input. We need the guidance. We need the support. Anybody want to move to Syracuse? Um, and clearly, you know, student affairs, admissions, doing the analyses. I highlighted the challenges of our applicant pool. You know, that's going to be one of the key issues as we look as to whether to go forward or not. Now, just a couple of moments, just because I, I do this on an annual basis, and I do want to um, just sort of update people. Um, from a financial standpoint, things are still challenging. You know, last year I reported that we were going to that uh, we were going to be operating, you know, with about a million dollar deficit or so, and we did. Now, this is our revenues. And I wouldn't have you pay too much attention to it because we had a lot of cash flow issues during the pandemic. There was one year where the state didn't give us any money and then they paid us back the next year. So it looked like that was a really great year. Um, you know, last year we actually got some money in June instead of July. And so, you know, this is, this is probably not as accurate a picture um, as I would like to be able to, to present in terms of how we're really doing. If we look at our reserves, this particular graph basically is, I got rid of the cash flow issues and put the money in the year that it was supposed to occur. And what you see is last year, we went down, we went from about 19.1 million to about 18.1 million. So about a million dollar loss last year. We've been pretty careful. Not super restrictive, but we have been cautious, particularly in terms of the hiring of personnel. With, with wage increases in the state not necessarily contributing to the salary pools, um, it's been particularly challenging. We got a little bit, about a half a million dollars from the state for new positions, um, but not you know, for, for salary increases. This year, we could actually be down as much as 1.5 million. Now, hopefully not. Um, but we do have some realities that we have to be very careful about. 
and we do have to start working. We have to continue to focus on, yes, you know, increasing patient census. You know, we need to continue to expand our research. Ultimately, the program in upstate New York will be of help, but not for some time. You know, and so there are a lot of things that we're going to have to do in order to, to sort of ameliorate that deficit from an operational standpoint, but always maintaining an understanding that everybody is already working hard. You know, and so part of it is how do we make sure that we balance our budget and that we have the room for growth, and that growth contributes to the future of the institution. Now finally, you know, the one place where the state is very generous, and we've been very successful, you know, uh, David Bowers, Sue Deep, I mean the whole team, you know, in tr helping to position us to receive monies to help support the infrastructure support uh, improvements here at the college. You know, right now we've got lined up, the CVRC is being c completed, the seventh floor is about to begin, the translational research laboratories have been approved, the fifth floor is in study design, that's $30 million, okay? For the upstate project to be successful, we probably, you know, between downstate and us, I'm downstate, upstate <laughs> and us, um, we're gonna be looking to have a building built, you know, to support the effort. You know, and so the state has actually been very good at investing in the infrastructure we need to make sure we're supportive as a community. So yes, the budget is tight. You know, it's gonna be a tight budget next year. Um, yes, we've got growth potential. Yes, we've got reasons for optimism. Yes, we have some challenges. But I'm very confident that, that we as a community can do it. So in closing, First, just to call out, I, I usually don't highlight them as much as I probably should, but the President's Council has been tremendous throughout. Um, and so I do want to say thank you to all members of our President's Council uh, so for their support, not just last year, but, but over all of the years. And then finally, just to thank you to the entire community. Um, you've gotten our latest annual report. I think those were distributed. Um, uh, here. So with that, I want to thank you all.